Good afternoon, my friends. The doctor is in the house. Happy Wednesday. Welcome back to another episode of To Your Health with Dr. G. Hey, today is going to be fierce, and I know why, because my guests today, Dr. Daryl Wilson and Dr. Kelsey Flanagan, they are fierce too, but hey, we're happy to welcome you back on this Wednesday afternoon. We got a little good weather outside today in the Chicagoland area. It's not snow, which is good. So again, we want people to come on out, tune in today, relax. This next segment that we're going to bring to you today is going to be fantastic because I'm so excited to have uh, my colleagues here because I've known them, number one, for a long time, and number two, they are emergency medicine physicians. So the title of today's show is my Get to Know Them series part three, Secret Confessions of the ER Doctor. So this show's been like a, it's, it's actually, we'll talk a little bit about it in a second with my guests, but this show's been actually like months in the making. So, uh, uh, you know, with, with, with having a lot of friends that are physicians, you got to give them like a long time so they can clear their schedules. And luckily, somebody sitting in this room writes the schedules for the ER doctors. And so, <laughs> so I think he wrote his schedule and then wrote his colleague's schedule to actually work with my schedule. <laughs> so that's actually really good. So uh, everybody else that's out there that had to work today, uh, maybe you guys are listening, turn, off your, turn on your Facebook and all that stuff. Check us out online at Facebook. Check us out at intellectualradio.com. And uh, you're just, just, just enjoy what we're going to bring to you today. So, so really what it is, I want to welcome everybody back. You know, people that have been following us on the show, they know what we're all about. We're all about giving people the right information so then that they can talk to their healthcare professionals, and hopefully at the end of the day live healthier and happier lives. And at the end of the day with the show, it's really about building trust and delivering truth. My name is Dr. Mark Gomez, board certified internal medicine physician practicing at Edward Hospital. Check me out on my website, www.drmarkgomez.com. Again, you're listening here live on Facebook and at intellectualradiostudios.com. So this is, this is awesome. Again, I'm so excited for you guys. Uh, but this is part of my Get to Know Them series. So over the last few weeks, we've been trying to introduce you all to people that I know that are in the trenches, people that are compassionate about what they do, really have the reason why they've gone into being practitioners. And when it comes down to emergency room physicians, the skill set that is required is insane. And, and I, I mean that in a good way because to be able to handle anything and everything, potentially, it's it just mind-boggling for me as a physician, so I have nothing but the highest respect for our emergency medicine physicians because of what they deal with uh, and really sometimes the unpredictability of it. It's different in internal medicine. Certainly we have our patients that are scheduled, and so I kind of know who's coming in and all that kind of stuff. We kind of know their background. These, these emergency medicine physicians, they have to really just kind of really think on the cuffs, and, but that's the best part of their training. So they're one of the highly, most highly skilled physicians around. So we're going to get to know them in a second, but what I want to do is I want to hit you guys with a quick disclaimer, as usual. The content of To Your Health with Dr. G is for informational and, and, and entertainment purposes only, and that the content is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, and or treatment. Further details can be found at www.toyourhealthwithdrg.com slash disclaimer. So how the show works is I basically ask my colleagues a lot of questions. I get to pick on them. You know, it's great. It's like, it's like going back to like grand medical rounds. school residency, grand rounds. I like that, Dr. Wilson. Uh, grand rounds where you got picked on as the medical student, as a resident. And now since it's my show, I can actually pick on them in a good way, though. But really, again, we're trying to make sure people have the right information and use that information to talk to their doctors, to talk to their healthcare team, to, again, live healthier and happier lives. And again, when we're talking about emergency room medicine physicians, I mean, these physicians are amazing. And the reality is that uh, almost all of us will cross your path at some point. Uh, so uh, why not get to know them a little bit more? And really some of the intimacies and intricacies of emergency medicine. So what I want to do is I want to welcome my guests today. We've got Dr. Kelsey Flanagan and Dr. Daryl Wilson. Dr. Flanagan, I've known her since our days at Loyola a long time ago. We have both aged gracefully, I would say. <laughs> Uh, we have, yeah. uh, and why not? Uh, and so uh, I met Dr. Flanagan uh, as medical students at our days at Loyola, and, um, and she's been a colleague of mine ever since. And then when I found out that you were coming to Edward Hospital in April, I was giddy as a schoolboy. There you go. Why not? But I know, like, I, I know that you know we've known each other for a long time, and you're an amazing physician, and you take 
tons of care of my patients. When they go to the emergency room, I see your name all the time, uh, which means my patients are still going there. But, uh, but, it, but it's just been amazing to know you for all these years, and I welcome you to the show. So Dr. Flanagan, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. It's really fun after all these years to do something like this. Hey, I'm so excited. I'm glad our schedules worked out courtesy of Dr. Wilson, uh, and, uh, and, but I'm glad everything worked out for us. Well, tell us a little bit about your background. Uh, where did you do, obviously, your medical school? Where did you do your emergency medicine training? Uh, and why did you get into the field of emergency medicine? So, as you said, I uh, went to medical school at Loyola here in Chicago, um, and then went out to Michigan, the Detroit suburbs, to William Beaumont Hospital for my residency. Um, and then wanted to come back home to Chicago when I finished and was very lucky to find a job at Edward. Um, I grew up in Naperville, so it was pretty pretty cool to be able to work at the hospital where I was born. Um, oh, nice. Yeah, I did not know that. A little known fact. <laughs> yeah, this is, again, so. secret confessions of the ER doctor, so there's a little known fact. <laughs> a little more secret confessions. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't know, in terms of emergency medicine, it had a lot of appeal to me. Uh, emergency medicine is a little bit like the redheaded stepchild of medicine. Um, and it's you know, kind of unique personalities there. And, you know, I'm not someone who really likes routine. I get kind of bored with doing the same thing over and over again. And emergency medicine is really good for that because you kind of never know what you're going to do every day. Excellent. Well, thank you again for coming on to the show, Dr. Flanagan. My next guest, Dr. Daryl Wilson. He and, my, he and I have known each other since I've basically been working at the hospital for 11 years now. And an interesting story is I actually met Dr. Wilson for the first time at the House of Blues a long time ago, and Dr. Wilson was performing. Yes, he is a musician uh, when he's not doing his medical career and everything. So I actually met him at the House of Blues in Chicago uh, in 2007 at a concert uh, with his band, The Bull Weevils, and then I see Dr. Wilson on the stage singing blowing his lungs out. I mean, it was just great. And so that was my first time meeting him, but uh, we've been friends ever since. Of course, just like Dr. Flanagan, Dr. Wilson's, his name uh, shows up all the time <laughs> for my patients that go to the emergency room. But again, we've known him for a long, I've known you for a long time, Daryl, you're a friend of mine. Yes. And so I wanted to welcome you to the show. So welcome to the show, Dr. Wilson. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Mark. Um, yeah, I'm Dr. Daryl Wilson. Um, you know, I have uh, been at Edward for a long time. You know, I actually am a Loyola graduate as well. Um, which is funny, I graduated many years before these two did, um, but I'm there at Loyola, you can find a picture there, mine's kind of across from Mark's almost. Um, but, uh, you know, I trained at Cook County Hospital for my emergency medicine training. Um, you know, great place to train, great place to learn. Um, you know, then of course worked in the city for some years for the county, as well as uh, worked on the west side for a while. Um, and finally got a chance to come home to Naperville. I'm also a Naperville kid too, went to Naperville Central where she also went to school uh, many years at, wait, you read you go. Naperville North. Oh, I oh, hate there's you. A, there's a rally. Again, right. this is a secret confession of the ER. Secret though, confession. Got a little rally right here between Kelsey. the doctors. No. Uh, this is ridiculous. She went to North. <laughs> so anyway, I went to the original school, Naperville Central. So um, <laughs> the original OG school. And, um, you know, then um, got a chance to come on back to uh, Naperville and being the ER physician there. I'm the EMS medical director as well. Um, you know, I love emergency medicine. Emergency medicine was kind of my pick from the get-go. Um, ever since I was actually in college, I thought about doing it. Um, you know, I did a rotation at Edward Hospital uh, through Benedictine. Um, and uh, at that point, I'm like, this is what I have to do. This was my calling. Um, it's a place where I get to use my ADHD to, you know, it's, it's best, I guess. You know, I, routine is one thing that I'm not really, you know, about. Um, it's kind of a rock star-ish kind of uh, profession to be in. Um, I like the challenges of dealing with the unknown coming in, and I like the, you know, elation of dealing with people's problems and making a difference in a very, very quick period of time. I also like the ability to go out and play rock and roll at the same time, too. Uh, yeah, you do. And, uh, <laughs> so, and even as, as you've aged gracefully as well, as, thank as you. I alluded to Dr. <laughs> Flanagan and I aging gracefully, you know, you've been able to go around and, and have passion, and passion whether it's through medicine or passion, as you said, in music. Right, and, and that's the thing about it. I think. It's one of the things that traits about emergency physicians, you have to be passionate about those things because you, you are getting hit with this onslaught of the unknown all the time. And, and you have to be able to be on your A game every time you go see a patient. And, and, and then getting something that actually distracts you away from the patient you're concentrating on, you have to then, once again, manifest this Herculean effort to get back up to A game again. And so you have to have this passion that's running through you all the time. 
Excellent. Well, that, Dr. Wilson, thank you for coming on the show. Thanks. So really, you know, again, this is part of my Get to Know Them series, part three, Secret Confessions of the Emergency Room Doctor. And, and again, we're talking about, about really, you know, getting to know them, of course, as individuals, as clinicians, as caring people, but really to understand more about emergency medicine. Because again, without a doubt, most of us are probably going to come through your guys' doors at some <laughs> point in life. But really, if we can make this process a lot more understanding, a lot more um, um, easy for people to, 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 to really grasp, then I think we can continue to have our goals. Your goals as emergency room physicians are really to assess the situation. And I always kind of say the, the line, treat them or street them, uh, or treat them and street them, whatever the phrase goes. But, you know, are you, go are you going home to come back and see me in my office, or are you coming in? Right. Uh, and nuts and bolts of it all. So I thank you both for coming in today. So I want to ask the question. So here's the question. So on the show, we always have something called the chief complaint. And the chief complaint is really when somebody comes in, and certainly you guys are hearing chief complaints all the time when people show up in your emergency room. But when people come into the, to the office in my setting as a primary care doctor, or you're sitting in the emergency room, they're coming in for a reason. And so really as we kind of phrase the question of our discussion today, is really, um, really realizing that number one, it takes a special set of skills to be an effective emergency room doctor, but also what makes what you guys do unique. Again, allowing us to kind of peel back the layers a little bit. I know in primary care, as I develop lifelong relationships with my patients, yes, I can kind of peel back the, a little bit. Yeah, I'm still there to treat them as a physician, but I'm able to actually bond more and talk a little bit more, things that I may feel comfortable sharing my, my, my life, or you tell people, hey, I've got, you know, I've got two children, or things like that. Or the time I had braces as an adult, that was another story. They're like, hey, Dr. Chi, you got braces? I go, absolutely, I got braces. I'm trying to make sure I'm good. And so, and so but, but you can share that kind of stuff with people and develop that. You guys, as emergency room doctors, of course, you guys are really to assess the situation. And there's no doubt you may develop some relationships uh, with, with patients that come in, certainly the frequent flyers, as we kind of call them. Sure. But, but I know you guys are really to, to do your job and then get them back and hopefully help being healthy again. So I want to ask Dr. Flanagan the first question, partly because you're sitting closest to me. <laughs> and since I've known you longer than Dr. Wilson, you get the first question, so I have to put you on the spot. Uh, so <laughs> that's just how it is. So why don't you kind of give us a little bit of a background. What is emergency medicine? How did it evolve? How did it develop? Um, What's the story behind emergency medicine? Sure. Well, it's actually kind of, well, I guess interesting to us because we are ear docs, but um, emergency medicine is one of the youngest specialties in medicine. Uh, really started out of public demand, which most other specialties, like surgery, internal medicine, just kind of developed naturally because people need doctors, people need surgery, things like that. But uh, emergency departments back in the day uh, were basically just staffed by interns, residents, sometimes on-call physicians in other specialties. Um, and the care was just because they weren't specifically trained to take care of traumas or heart attacks in, in the acute setting, not necessarily as good as it is these days. So um, in around 1970 was when the specialty really started to come about. Um, the, first EMS, the first emergency medicine residency was in 1970. The first resident was in, or the first department started in 1971. Um, and I don't think it was a board boarded specialty till 1979, so kind of a newer one. Yeah, yeah that's very interesting on the origins of that. You know, you think about since the, ever since the history of mankind, yes, or emergency situations that that that, ar that arose and that continued to arise. But I did not know really about some of the formality of this, and it was it is really relatively a really recent field. Yeah, less than 50 years old, really. Think wow. about it, 50 years old at the most. So, so let me ask you this, Dr. Wilson. How did it? You know, you know, there it is now, 19 early 70s, and then formally. Uh, uh, recognized as a board in the late 70s. Mm -hmm. What's the evolution been like in emergency medicine? I mean, I mean, for us, I mean, I can even just go back 18 years ago for me, I mean, as an attending, um, things have changed rapidly. I mean, you look at the advent of the way we care for cardiac patients, the way we care for stroke patients, um, you know, the electronic medical record. I mean, I was writing on paper charts back in the day, and to find you know, information on patients, you had to go to medical records and get charts sent to you to go through the charts by hand to find information that may be pertinent. I mean, if somebody was seen the day before, you may not even have that chart yet because it might not be filed yet. So we, the, the way all medicine has changed, the way all things have changed with the advent of technology, with the uh, information that we gain on seeing patients over time and having controlled studies on things, we were doing things that we weren't doing before way back when. I mean, um, you know, back in the day, to think about ordering an MRI on an individual was like pulling teeth mm -hmm. when I was training. 
And now, I, I, I ordered three MRIs yesterday <laughs> in a row on patients. And so th these, the things that we do are always constantly evolving. Um, and it's always to the benefit, you know, well, we hope it's always to the benefit of the patient. Um, we always have to still continue to study things. We have to still continue to look at things and see are they truly, you know, quality things that we're doing at the same time. Are they efficient? Are they necessary? Because um, you can ask for the newest bells and whistles on things, but it may not really be effectively treating the patient's condition. Um, but, you know, the way emergency medicine has evolved, I mean, it was kind of haphazard and just a bunch of folks doing things. And then we had to get training to specifically look at the emergency care of the patient. And, and, and as our training program talked about, as emergentologists, that's what we are. You know, you can have a cardiologist, we're an emergentologist. And we look at the emergencies and we're the experts in those emergencies that actually come in to see us. Um, and I take pride in that. You know, that's one thing that I, I'm, I'm going to really jam on your diabetic ketoacidosis when you come in and you're, you know, comatose. But if you want me to sit there and look at your A1Cs and, and manage you as an outpatient, that's not going to happen. So that's, 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 that's happen. my job. That's your job. That's your job. <laughs> but, but, you know, the, the, the advances when it comes to technology and how we use that to our advantage is just amazing. The use of bedside ultrasound, um, even the way we obtain knowledge at the bedside to do you know, on-the-spot teaching for things, where it used to be, hey, you know what, remember when you did that cricothyroidotomy back in the day? Now I'm going to go back to the procedure book and take a look at it. Now you can just find it on your handheld computer device and know all the things you need to know, again, to remind yourself of certain things if you actually had a little lapse in education at that point. So ER has, has evolved dramatically in, 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 in ways that are just almost science fiction in some ways, but, but we live it every day, which is exciting, and on the cusp of new things. Excellent. I mean, you talk about innovation, which is which is huge in medicine. We're seeing it and from a primary care standpoint too. But what you guys are doing, I mean, the innovation, the fact that like you have the resources, you know, certainly of a hospital, at your disposal to do right away that what used to take what well, sometimes for me might take weeks to do, days to weeks to schedule something. The fact that you guys can do it right away, I find I find that amazing because it helps you guys out to assess the situation. What's your thoughts on that, Dr. Flanagan? Well, uh, it's really helpful, especially if you have someone where you're considering something emergent, to be able to get, like you said, like advanced mm -hmm. imaging, MRIs. We, as Daryl said, or Dr. Wilson said, we do a lot of MRIs in the emergency department. Even when I was training a little after you, mm -hmm. it was pulling teeth. <laughs> there were like two indications that you could order an MRI for. Right. You had to call the radiologist and beg them to let you do it. And now we order them all the time, but it's so helpful. I mean, so many stroke patients, I think, receive much better care because we're able to do this advanced imaging and work in a really quick time frame, whereas back, you know, the way that things were done in the past, we weren't able to intervene in such quick ways without knowing the results, exactly where lesions are and things like that. I think we're delivering much better care. Well, think of the saving, results. you know, that we're also using less, you know, ionizing radiation on patients mm -hmm. as well, which is something that we have to look at. I mean, you think about, and I always say this as a joke to patients, I mean, we have to discuss the risk benefit of certain things that we do. And, you know, you talk about CAT scans and all these things that we're doing to individuals. And, and I say, you know, in the world of superheroes, you know, radiation gives you superpowers. But in the world that we live in, it gives you cancer. So you got to really think about what we're doing before we do things. And we have all kinds of alternative imaging techniques that we can do to kind of assess the patient and help us with the disposition at times. Um, I mean, when you think about the whole thing of having all this technology and, and all the resources available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year in an emergency department, it's a vital, vital part of the community when you look at the care. And, and you think about this, it, it's, when you look at like the, the, the cost of health care, like what is it, like $24 billion a year cost of health care, the cost of ER care is like only 2% of that. And, and we have this availability of care. So you think about what we do, it's very efficient in some sense. It's extremely available. efficient. I mean, two thirds of people will come in to see us because they have no access to anything else. I mean, office is closed. You're not there all the time, are you? No, I'm not. But, but we're there all the time. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, you know, to gain access to those things at a time that's convenient in some sense, um, to have the ability to actually then make a disposition for a person who may have an emergent condition that's there, that's an amazing feat when you talk about the way that we care for patients. I mean, there's 140 million people seen a year in emergency departments. And we are there at the forefront of caring for 140 million people a year. 
which is crazy. Not just us in our ER alone. That's not, <laughs> I'm talking about across the nation. You need to have to clone yourself. Right. Yeah. You, the, the you work a lot, but not that much. I, I, <laughs> you do write the schedule, so you can schedule I, I something. I really don't write the schedule. I'm sorry, Barb, I know you write the schedule. Thank you for what you do. I know. I'm just joking. <laughs> so, I'm giving you credit. <laughs> well, I'm going to schedule for a bunch of yeah. shows that are great. Yeah, right. But you're talking you're talking the truth about, again, you're, you're able to have this resource to provide it for the community 24 7 so again you guys are do, still doing the same thing that we're doing from a from a primary care center we want our patients want our communities to be healthy right there's no doubt and what you guys do is are, is so critical to everything to I mean, you mean it's it's such a critical role in health of our communities it, it, I mean, it is i mean <laughs> but you think about health in general and, and the goal is to be healthy all the time i mean we're there yeah. when you know health may fail you at a, at a time that is not predictable. And that's what we're there for when we talk about emergencies. I mean, so there's a time where injury occurs or a, a, a not predictable, you know, a, a ailment that you're going to get at a time. And that's definitely a time that we are going to shine at that point. Um, but the key thing for anything with health is preventing some of these things that you can prevent from occurring. I mean, I, if I'm going to sit back and just, you know, continue to abuse myself by eating poorly, by not exercising, by not resting, and then, you know, hoping that, hey, you know what, when the time comes and I start getting that chest pain that I'm getting, I'm just going to go in and you're going to put a wire into me and fix it all up. Well, that's great. How about doing some preventative things so that doesn't have to happen in the first place? Or if it does happen, that we have a better chance of giving you better survivability because you don't have all these other, you know, comorbidities that are there as well. So, I mean, yeah, health is what we do promote, and we're there for acute care, and we do try to actually promote healthy living for the community, especially with injury prevention, things like that. Um, but, you know, the key thing is your work yeah. in the field as a primary care physician is super important when it comes to your patients being healthy when they see us and then going back as healthy as they can be as well. I agree. I tell my patients, I go, listen, I mean, emergency rooms are there for that reason. I want you, I want to do everything in my power to make sure that you are good. Uh, and so you're talking about prevention as a mindset, but it's got to be even more reality. Because you're right, we live in a disease society. We, that's how, how the healthcare system is built. Mm -hmm. We're trying to change the collective mindset. And I think it's done, and I think this kind of a format is, is what we're trying to do. So hearing your guys' story and your passion is just awesome because you guys truly want people to do well. You truly want people not to have accidents. You truly want people not to have strokes. You truly want people not to have heart attacks. And the list goes on and on and on of things you're doing. But the reality is, yes, you guys, you guys are providing those services. So let me ask you this question, Kelsey. I'm going to ask you this. What does a typical work day look like for you? Because the reality is that when you think about emergency room medicine, and it's portrayed like crazy, it's all sleek, it's sexy, it's danger, it's We are sleek and sexy, that's, that's <laughs> true, that's well, not denied. I can say that we did. We all age gracefully since our days at medical school, there's no doubt we about that. Uh, that's why we're now. sitting down at the table, just in case to hide the midsection a little bit, that's all right. But, uh, but no, but it's like, it's, like, it's like what you guys do, I mean, it's so portrayed on so many different forms of medium, media, what TV and movies and things like that, and so really, is it really like that? I mean, I think <laughs> most media might take like a month's worth of craziness and yeah. distill it into like five minutes. It's not that crazy all the time. We get really busy sometimes, but the majority of patients we see are not, you know, actively dying or super critically ill. Um, but it, you kind of never know what your day is going to look like. You might get a stroke followed by a heart attack, followed by a child with a fever, followed by an ankle sprain and you have to just kind of manage all of them simultaneously and to the best of your ability. So you kind of just don't know what you're going to get every day when you walk in. I think when you guys are talking about, as you mentioned just a second ago, Dr. Flanagan, that you have to just, you have to do things very simultaneously. I mean, you guys are really on the, on the run. I mean, you're not just seeing like one patient at a time. You guys are trying to triage. You're trying to rely on your staffing um, to get you in the right situation, the right time to make the right, the right decisions. Talk about, uh, I'll ask you a follow-up question, Kelsey. Talk about just how the importance is of having like a good staff to allow you to do your job to the best of your ability. Oh, it's huge. And we're so lucky at Edward. We have the most amazing nurses and techs and radiology staff and just support staff 
and other docs too. Yeah. Um, but we really count on, we really work as a team, we count on each other. So, you know, if Dr. Wilson or I were stuck in a room with a patient who was critically ill, say they were having CPR done to them and needed to be intubated and needed a procedure, you know, we may be in that room for 45 minutes to yeah. an hour straight, which in the ER is an eternity. Um, and so all the other patients have to wait for us and then also we rely on our nurses to take care of that. So say someone came in with a kidney stone while that was happening, our nurses would put in an IV, they would order labs, they would give pain medicine so that person's not just sitting there suffering for an hour while we're taken away by another sadly more critical patient. Um, so I mean the ER is such a team, teamwork environment. We really right. count on each other to fill in the gaps and just all do our jobs, and it really runs like clockwork when that happens. You know, when I think about ER, and the last time I was actually seeing patients in the ER was <laughs> was when I was a medical student doing an ER rotation. I'm just joking. I did a little bit. Well, I would come down before I give my, my inpatient duties at the hospital. I'd come down and see you guys in the emergency room and see my patient as they're about to get admitted to the hospital. But, 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 you, but one of the things that I always thought about as a physician, as an internist, the amount of like protocols that are out there, I mean, you guys have to run like a well-oiled machine. And so there, you guys have been trained and going back to like, again, 30, 30, 40 years ago, it's so much more regimented, but you're able to do so much because of those protocols. What's your thoughts on that, Dr. Wilson? Well, that's the key thing that helps us. I mean, if you look at the typical day, as, as Kelsey is explaining, it's like spinning plates. And, and really you have to have, you know, we can spin those plates. We know how to do that. We've been trained to spin plates, but you know, plates sometimes start to fall and having a multitude of individuals around you to try and keep those plates from crashing to the ground is super important. And having a protocol in place that says, hey, if plate number six is spinning and it's wobbling, I need you to put that plate back up a little bit or take that pole and move it this way, that's gonna keep all those plates from falling down. So having protocol-driven care is gonna be key. You know, Having you know, a computer-driven system so that we can have stops that will keep us from making a medical error or making us you know, not look and see that this patient requires something different than where we're going, that helps us to keep our brains kind of focused on things because we have all these distractions that are pulling us away. I mean, it's not only just seeing the patient here who's critically ill, a patient might not be that ill here, a new patient coming in we need to assess. Sometimes you're getting phone calls back from your consultants that you need to go back and talk about the patient five minutes ago that you were just thinking of. And then you get a, another thing from a tech who's telling you that they need you to check on a split or you have another distraction from another phone call from someplace else. It's all these things that are there that are taking you out of your kind of focused mindset. So we, we have to be able to take all this kind of almost anarchy and entropy and keep it focused. I mean, and, and if you think about it, that's kind of the whole thing of insanity, if you think about it. I mean, everything <laughs> moves towards <laughs> randomness, but we're constantly yeah. taking things and trying to put it back into order and so th that is it, it takes protocol it takes you know a way of doing things that has to be driven down the line that you don't step out of that line in some sense yeah you can think outside of the box and you have to but you have to be able to do that in a regimented fashion so you don't skip things and because if you do that's where we make errors and, and, and a part of what we do in our day is working with limited information lots of times and we have to be able to make a leap of confidence to say this is what we're doing and it really if you think about what a good ER physician is it's a person that can make decisions and be definitive in their decisions and say I'm doing this because this is the best thing to do right now with the information I'm provided with and you may be wrong but you have to say that was the best thing I had and I move forward with that and, and that's a big thing that makes a good ER physician is that you're confident and you have to be confident in the face of having limited information at times I, I think about just you know just give the facts you know that's one of the things I talk about uh, to people, even some of my patients, when I say, hey, you know, if you go to an emergency room, I hope you don't ever have to go, but when you go there, give them the facts, because they're there to help you, without a doubt, they'll help you to move from point A to point B, and hope that point A to point B is coming right back to me, just as healthy as you were, and et cetera, and things like that. But, you know, we gotta, we gotta just do it, do it like that. So it's, I think it's, again, you're talking about the regimen and stuff, and I think that's huge. And medicine has, has been more, you know, Dr. Rose was saying, you know, you have to kind of think outside the box. Medicine does still allow you to think outside the box, but, 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 but having those kind of protocols, even in internal medicine, primary care, we have our protocols because we know they work, but we refine our protocols. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what you guys have done over the years. So let me ask you this question, Dr. Flanagan. You know, you're you're more of the recent graduate than Dr. Wilson, mm -hmm. but that's all right. So, so, so you get fresh ideas. That's what I like about it. Um, just give me like a sense, like even, even just as you've been out, you know, what, what's changed? I mean, I, I mean, outside of, we know electronic medical records are, are here to stay, you get information right there, but 
how have you evolved during this time too? Well, I think there's a lot of learning as a physician that you take on throughout your career. So, I mean, I feel like I'm constantly learning new things and there's just new procedures, new techniques, new ways of treating people that have come out. Um, I think medicine is becoming increasingly more challenging as we face, uh, you know, shortages in funding, um, restrictions from insurance companies. So I think we're, we're constantly trying to do as much as we possibly can with the limited resources that we have, and I feel like that's, that's gotten more challenging in the time that I've been practicing. It's true that the number of ERs had gone down for, for a number of years. I'm not sure if it's flattened out or anything, but the reality is that the number of emergency rooms had gone down in this country nationally, but the number of visits that you guys have seen have gone up mm -hmm. uh, while those closings were happening. And so the funding aspect, as you mentioned, is super important because it's such a need for the communities without a doubt. And I think a lot of times, even when you think about communities that may not have some of the resources that we're blessed to have right now in Naperville, um, you know, communities that may be more rural communities, communities that may be in underserved areas where they don't have just the, the just the, the well-oiled machine, so to speak, that's a challenge. What do you think about that, Dr. Wilson? How do we kind of keep things equitable uh, across the board as we're trying to take care of everyone? I mean, it, it's hard. I mean, you're looking at a, a trying to find ways to economically do that in places that you may have issues with, you know, reimbursement. Um, you know, I, I guess when you look at the patient populations and how they grow, like, like a question that would come in is that as, as we have more and more population aging, how are we going to deal with that in some sense? Because um, that's, that's a good thing. If you think about it, the, the population that ages is not going to change in the number. They're just going to get old, okay? And, and when people get old, they use more resources in that sense. So if they do come to the ER, they're going to probably stay in the ER longer. They're going to require more workups. They're going to require more diagnostic testing, and that's going to be problematic. And what happens then is it puts a kind of stranglehold on us moving those patients to the hospital because we're they're staying in the ER longer, and they have longer hospital stays as well. Um, and with that comes the, you know, how do you get reimbursed for all that equitably to make sure that what we're doing, we're going to, of course, recoup that and allow that to be reinvested in the care of the patients. Um, you know, it, it's it's a hard conundrum. It's something that you have to really look at and say, what, what are we doing as a society, and what do we really care about when we think about our health? Our, our, is it that we are, are just looking at the constant kind of putting a band-aid on the problem versus coming in and saying, hey, maybe we need to really look at how we care for everyone, how we care for the ill, how we care for the healthy, how we keep people healthy so they don't become so ill. Um, yeah, you, you caught me on that, Mark, because it, it's, it's more than just, like you know, <laughs> us as, as ER docs. It's, it's, everybody it's everybody looking yeah. at how do you really think we as society should function. We should be a healthy society because the healthier society is, the happier society is, the more prosperous society is going to be. And so if we really want to go forward and be great, we got to really take some hard looks at ourselves and say, what does that really mean? Well, this kind of discussion allows for that and allows to kind of get people to look inside, listen inside, look inside your brains and kind of hear your thought process on really us as clinicians, as physician leaders on what we need to do. There's so many challenges out there, but we're really trying our darnest to make systematic change. So I want to ask this kind of question, and again, you guys are listening here live on intellectualradio.com, and uh, so I want to kind of paint the picture this way. You know, we've talked a little bit about just kind of the role of emergency medicine, how it's evolved, but I want to dig in a little bit deeper into your guys' collective mindset. So I got a couple questions for you guys, so here we go. This is where it's going to make this a little more secret confession. Speed uh, around something. So yeah, we're going to speed around. It's like speed dating. Uh, so here we go. So I want to ask this question to Dr. Flanagan. All right, I want you to finish the following statement. Here's what I'm going to say, and then you finish the statement. So here we go. People have a much better chance of not ending up in the ER if... They listen to their primary care doctor. Oh, you're too kind. You're too kind. Yeah, you're too kind. No, kai. but really, I mean, the... the I had you on my show, like of course, been, that's why. Like yeah. we've been saying, I think prevention is so important, and I think that in, in America we don't necessarily take very good care of ourselves. And if we listen to our primary care doctors, mm -hmm. like Dr. Gomez, oh, and yeah. follow their advice and lose weight and exercise and, you know, monitor their health and get your colonoscopy when you're supposed to and all that stuff that... That's, that's a good way to stay out of the ER. 
Excellent. I'm going to ask the same question that Dr. Wilson. Here you go. Finish the following statement. People have a much better chance of not ending up in the ER if... They don't get into the hold my beer mentality. I mean, that's one thing. I mean, that has definitely is, leads to the majority of individuals that we can see because of you know, preventable injury. Um, but truly, it is a matter of taking some ownership of your health and understanding that if there are risks that you're going to take, you can have a risk reward benefit there and say, you know what, if I'm going to play in traffic, there's a chance I get hit by a car, right? So if you're going to take that risk, maybe you should look both ways before you play in traffic. Maybe you should plan a cul-de-sac that's actually closed off. You could pick other things to make yourself have less risk of ending up with a femur fracture or a hip fracture, things like that. So um, like I said, unexpected things happen. That's what we're there for too. I mean, we're up for the unexpected injuries that take place. But truly, if you don't wear a helmet when you're riding a bike or you don't wear a helmet when you're skateboarding and you hit your head, there's a likelihood you're going to have a severe traumatic brain injury. And you can prevent that. So you don't wear a seatbelt when you're in your car, there's a likelihood you're going to come in and have a severe traumatic injury from the car crash that you're in. So there are things that we can do as human beings, which seem very logical, <laughs> and, and we can That's avoid true. you know, harming ourselves by just taking maybe a second to just use this part of your body, your brain, and think, and say, maybe I shouldn't have that, you know, six to drink and then get into the car. Or text and drive. Maybe, yeah. Maybe. Everyone I see on the road is texting and driving. Wow. <laughs> maybe Always. I should go and get my colonoscopy, which I know I'm supposed to get my colonoscopy. My wife is watching. Oh, probably say that. Yes. <laughs> maybe, maybe I should listen to my primary care physician when they tell me that maybe I should be watching what I'm eating. Maybe I should be working out more. My cholesterol might be a little high. Maybe I get control of that blood pressure that's actually out of control. Those things are going to make you stay out of the emergency department. Um, but then again, you could do all that, and the fates could get you. Fate gets you. Yeah, that just happened, and we're still going to be there to take care of you. But there are things you can do as a regular human being and use your brain to think and say, maybe the thinking part's a good thing to do, and I wouldn't end up hurt and, and having me stand over you. I'm going to answer the statement myself from a primary care standpoint. Here we go. Uh, the Dr. G version. People have a much better chance of not ending up in the ER if they stay risk adverse. Mm -hmm. I like that. Because that's what everybody's really talking about. Dr. Wilson eloquently stated uh, the realities of seeing challenges when you're more risk taking versus risk averse. All right, Dr. Flanagan, here's the next statement. Finish the statement. Here we go. Knowing what you know, you cringe a little when you see somebody do what? <laughs> well, I'll go back to the texting and driving thing because so I commute from Chicago all the way to Naperville, so I'm on the highway a lot. And every time I look at any car next to me, the person's on their phone. So, oh my gosh, that I cringe. And I cringe when I see people on motorcycles, particularly if they don't have a helmet. I, every time oh. it just hits me in my gut because you, you, you make me cringe. So right many of the bad motorcycle or so many of the bad traumas I've seen have been motorcycle related, especially oh. without the helmet. So. Please be careful on your motorcycles, and please always, always wear a helmet and protective. Yep. And no texting stuff. while you're driving. Or person. riding your motorcycle. Yeah. Yeah. Dr. Wilson, here you go. Same question to you. Knowing what you know, you cringe a little when you see somebody do what? <laughs> Don't make me cringe. I mean, you go ahead and say it, but I might cringe. I'm going to keep it really, you know, PG, I guess, because there's a lot of things that make me cringe when I see people doing them. Um, you know, what, what probably makes me cringe the most is actually watching individuals who are distracted while they're driving because that's something where you can be doing everything in your power to stay in your lane, be safe, and another person's actually not really thinking about what they're doing at that point and could be in jeopardy. And I think about, you know, my kids walking to the bus stop and then getting hit by somebody who's not paying attention. So that makes me cringe. When you're distracted and you're not paying attention to what you're doing, that leads to injury not only to yourself but other people. Um, you know, and yes, drive, riding a motorcycle without a helmet just makes me like, what are you doing? It, it makes I no sense. Know. I mean, I know it's okay. Yeah. You want to be cool, you got to have your hair flowing in the wind. I mean, I got a lot yeah. of hair. That's you gotta cool. be cool, baby. But a helmet <laughs> to protect your central computer of your body, your brain, is like just paramount. So you can just do that, prevent injury, just prevent it. So I cringe when I see that happen. I also cringe, though, when I see individuals walking down the street with crutches and they're not using their crutches correctly, they're just walking with crutches. I, I don't get that. It's like you're trying to use crutches and I just want to yell like, you're doing it wrong. I just want to do that. I'll be honest, uh, that. it's hard to walk on crutches. crutches uh, so they're hard. so hard. Somebody's got to like teach you that. 
They got to teach that. That's a, that's a skill, man. It, it is a skill. <laughs> it is easily attainable. People can use that. Yeah. But when they've learned this and they walk out and they're just walking on the crutch, it's like, just, <laughs> just throw them away. Stop. Just, just, just throw them away. You're not doing anything. Right. I'm going to answer the statement myself. So here we go. The Dr. G version. Knowing what you know, you cringe a little when you see somebody do what? I'm going to say... When I see bones going the wrong direction, that bones shouldn't go. That makes me cringe. Um, ugh, I'm just thinking about it right now. It's like, ugh. That's not a cringe no, movie thing. Yeah, I'm like, uh, uh, well, again, again. Yeah. My primary care hat, you guys, ER dots, you're like, uh, I see bones going the wrong direction all the time. So, straight them out. Straight them out. So that's just basically, it gives me the willies. I'm just like, ugh. All right, so here you go. Next question, Dr. Flanagan. Here we go. What one medical skill should everybody learn? What's your thoughts? Um, I would say CPR is a good one to know. Um, and also, in conjunction with that, knowing about AICDs. Because uh, they've become much more commonplace in our society. Uh, like schools, churches, everywhere should basically, businesses should have an AICD. Hey. And, oh sorry, AED, yeah, you're right. right. She's, she's <laughs> them into people. That's, <laughs> that's all right. Just that's put it under the skin. That's the AED, cardiology thank show you, I'll do thank this you. sometime in 2019. Um, but you're right, though. But yeah, speaking. because so much, so many cardiac arrests occur because of abnormal heart rhythms, and CPR is only really a temporizing measure. It's not going to save someone's life. It's not going to fix the problem. It's just going to keep circulation going until the problem can be fixed. And AEDs have saved so many people's lives. I mean, we see people, I've seen multiple patients who came in who were in a terrible heart rhythm, a fatal arrhythmia, and they come in after getting shocked by the AED awake and talking. And wow, it's, that's it's great. just amazing. So just familiarize, familiarize yourself with CPR. It's not complicated. And then also just have a general idea of what an AED is. And it's very simple. Straightforward, anyone can use one, but you could definitely save a life. Excellent. Dr. Wilson, here we go. Yeah. What one medical skill should everybody learn, in your opinion? So just to dovetail on to what Kelsey was saying, I mean, definitely CPR and AEDs are important to understand, but I think one other thing to add to that would be learning how to stop the bleed. I think that's a new campaign. We have to really think about this, considering that we, we do have a very violent society that we actually live in, and the likelihood that we're going to have an incident where there are mass casualties in a, uh, coming to us stopping the bleed in the field and having the ability to use tourniquets and you know, apply direct pressure or use even you know, combat gauze, things like that are important skills that anybody can learn. They're simple things to learn and I think that's a very important skill to learn because we do have this high incidence of violence being unfortunately wrought upon our, our society. So learning to stop the bleed I think is another important skill and it's very simple. Um, so you can go and look at that up uh, it, as well. So add that to your CPR, add that to AEDs, stopping the bleed is important as well. Excellent. I'm going to answer the question myself. Here we go. The Dr. G version. What one medical skill should everybody learn? It's not necessarily a skill, it's a command for me. I say come in and see your primary care doctor at least <laughs> once a year for your annual complete physical exam. There you go. <laughs> I tried to change it up a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so here, so here you go. All right, Dr. Flanagan, what is the most rewarding part of your job? Well, I mean, there's a lot that's rewarding about it, but, and Daryl kind of alluded to this earlier, but just being able to take someone who, either take someone who has a, a concern, say they're having some abdominal pain and they're scared, they have appendicitis, and do some testing and be able to reassure them, no, everything looks okay, like you're going to go, you're going to be okay, you can go home tonight and not worry that you need emergency surgery, um, or taking someone who's critically ill, like we were talking about before we started, um, Dr. Wilson saw somebody who was, who was having a heart attack and their heart stopped and he was able to get the heart restarted and the patient came in a couple weeks later walking and talking and mm -hmm. I mean that there's nothing more rewarding than that. Love it. Dr. Wilson, what's the most rewarding part for you? I, you know, I think that we have this, you know, ability to affect, you know, individuals and make their day go from the worst day of their life to the best, the, the, one of the best days of their lives. We can do that. Um, there's not many professions where you can actually become intimately involved in a person's life that quickly um, and make a big difference in that short period of time. Um, and, and, and having the few people that say this say thank you. That, that doesn't happen often in emergency medicine. You don't get thanked a lot for the stuff that you do. And you have to have this innate ability to understand what you're doing is important and, and what we do is important. Um, our colleagues, we can all speak to each other about it and, and it, it helps us. But to have those people that we care for come back and say thank you, or even one person in a day say thank you, can kind of really pick you up 
uh, at a time. So, I mean, that's probably the important things that you, you do make a difference in people's lives. Sometimes you forget about it. And when we get reminded of that, it just kind of rejuvenates you and you can continue to do what we do. So I think that's an important thing. I think that that's what makes me, you know, have this wonderful feel about emergency medicine on days when you sometimes don't feel very good about it. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, you talk about medicine being, instead of what you guys do, being, it can be very emotional, but we are, we're human and emotions are a normal part of our, our existence. And so, you know, you want to care for people, you guys genuinely care for people, and that's your job, but you also genuinely have that sincerity there. And when something goes great, you know, and your patient is, is happy and they're healthy and they're back there, that's great. And when something challenging happens, just as human nature, our emotions can take over, but you have to kind of just compartmentalize yourself and just say, you know, I'm going to redirect and, and focus again. And it's kind of hard sometimes when you think about it as a physician. I, I know for you guys, seeing more even the potential for very dangerous situations, you know, in a primary care setting, you know, again, my day's kind of planned on who I think I'm going to see and all that kind of stuff, but I developed those kind of long-term relationships over years so you get to know the mom and the dad and the cousins and the kids and all that stuff. So you develop that, that emotional relationship that way. But what you guys are doing, it still requires to be, to be emotionally sound and, and comfortable with yourself to be able to help people when they're at their most vulnerable. Right. Yeah, so I like that. So we've got about 10 minutes left. So I want to I wanna go through a, sec uh, a section that I introduced on the show months ago, but I have to do it because this is one of the reasons why I got into the show in the first place, is to dispel myths. Mm -hmm. And so I wanna, the reality is that there's a lot of false and misleading information out there when it comes to health. And so really part of the reason for, one of the many reasons why we developed the show is to really make sure people have the right, the right information so it can leverage me, leverage my network of professionals, my clinicians uh, who are amazing at the, what they do, and let's just set the record straight. We were talking a little bit on the, uh, before we got on the air about you know, Dr. Google and, and Dr. <laughs> whatever on the internet, and that's not your diagnosis. So we're gonna set the record straight, so here we go. Emergency room myths versus facts. And so what I do is I say a statement, I'm gonna pick on Dr. Flanagan first again, because she's sitting right next to me, and I know any longer than Dr. Wilson, uh, so therefore you win, by, you win by default. But I'm gonna pick on her first, I'm gonna say a statement, and then you're gonna just answer it with myth or fact, and then just give us a few sentences why it's a myth or why it's a fact. All right, here we go. To your health, Dr. G, emergency room, emergency room, myths versus facts. Dr. Flanagan, here we go. Emergency departments are valuable to communities and are a central part of the medical neighborhood. Myth or fact? Well, obviously, be a little biased since I work in one, but I would say it's definitely <laughs> well, a fact. You can be biased um, on this show. That's yeah, fine. All right, you're, you're, you guys have been vetted, so it's all good. When I have <laughs> my guests on this show, you're vetted, so it's legit. Unfortunately, most people will probably need our services at some point in their lives, so. It's kind of one of those things, it's almost like a universal experience. Most everyone's been to the ER for something, um, and we're always there. Excellent. Dr. Wilson, myths versus facts, here you go. Emergency departments are crowded because people abuse the system by seeking care for minor problems, myth or fact. So that's actually a myth. Um, so if, if you really think about the true number of individuals that are seen in emergency departments, you could, you could actually break it down to those that could avoid going to the emergency department and those that may have non-urgent causes that come to the ER. And the uh, ones that could avoid are those that don't require any diagnostic testing, any kind of workup, any imaging. Those would be people with dental emergencies, alcohol-related things, because we sometimes sit there as a drunk tank to have people sitting there who are just sobering up to go home, they need a ride home. And a lot of times mood disorders where individuals don't necessarily require us to see them when they just require seeing their psychiatrist or going in to get some care. Um, and then there's like only like 10% of patients that are actually in the EDs are the ones that actually have these, you know, non-urgent things that they see. But that still means that they require some imaging, they require, you know, some diagnostics, um, some medications, and actually about 0.5% of those people might get admitted to the ICU. So, so I mean, you, you, so there's still, uh, the majority of individuals that are in the ED are, are there for emergency complaints. And, and you can't really, you know, blame the lay person coming in who has a complaint of chest pain and it ends up in the end being, you know, indigestion, you know, being GERD, to say that they didn't come in for a legitimate complaint of chest pain. I mean, the, the sad thing is there are insurance companies that are not trying to tell you after the fact, hey, guess what, that wasn't an emergency. Yeah. So. It, it's it's it boggles the mind. It's like that, that's problematic in the sense that you're expecting a layperson to suddenly discern between their emergency before they come to the emergency department. That's insanity. Yeah. 
So no, I mean, there, there's, we're not overburdened with these freeloading people just hanging around doing stuff. That's a myth. That's a myth. Thank you for yeah. clarifying that. Here you go, myth versus fact, Dr. Flanagan. I can get all of my primary care services at the emergency room. Myth no. or fact? No, we are not primary care doctors. We were not trained to do what Dr. Gomez can do. So we people ask me all the time what their cholesterol was when we did their blood work. I don't know. We don't check cholesterol because it's not really ever related to an emergency. Or if you want a second opinion on whether or not you need your hernia repaired, like we're not really able to do that. So I would encourage people if you have primary care issues to go see your primary care physician because probably going to be frustrated that we're not that helpful. Right. Dr. Wilson, myth versus fact. I need a pediatrician to treat my child in the ER. No, that's actually a myth. You don't require a pediatrician to treat your uh, child in the ER. We are board certified emergency physicians. Um, we have trained to take care of uh, emergencies with all patient ages from the elderly to those that are just neonates. Um, that is a part of our training. So when it comes down to the emergent care, of individuals. Once again, we are emergentologists. That is our specialty, and that actually encompasses every person that we see. Um, so no, you don't require a pediatrician uh, to be seen in the emergency department. Thank you. Dr. Flanagan, here's the statement. The, the emergency room sees patients on a first-come, first-served basis. Myth or fact? That is a myth, obviously. Uh, we cannot let the person having a heart attack sit in the waiting room while we see the person with an ankle sprain. So please try not to get too frustrated if you have to wait. You never want to be the person who's rushed back and seen immediately in the ER. It's actually the place where you'd be just be glad you're the person who has to wait because that probably means that you have something less serious going on. All right, thank you. We'll do the last one on Dr. Wilson. Someone says in public, great, there's a doctor on the scene. We're all going to be fine. <laughs> so that's kind of a combo thing. It's like a <laughs> factual myth in some sense. So I mean, the reality is that we're, we're limited by not having some of our diagnostic tools and some of the things that may re be required. I mean, you could have a cut, and if I, m I may have like a, a medical kit in my house that could help you and I could repair them, but if I'm just walking down the street, I'm not carrying suture with me. I'm not carrying anything. An AED needs to be around for me to do something. I can recognize the ailment and say, you need to be in an environment where we can do more things. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, a doctor on scene, um, it depends on the doctor you get to. I mean, yeah. I, if you're having chest pain and an ophthalmologist is there, you might have some problems. So. How are those eyeballs looking right now, my friend? But you're right, hey, it's, it's, it's legitimate. And, and so you're, I'm glad you guys are setting the, the record straight. We're kind of all chuckling for that last one, but it's so true. All right, then. So we got about five minutes left. So this has been just an amazing discussion. Just you know, talking about the nature of, of really what you guys do as emergency medicine physicians, but also kind of getting into both of your collective mindsets on how you, you kind of approach situations and what it's really like to be in the trenches, but also at the same time being a, a caring physician leader. So I, again, I thank you guys for both coming on. I want to kind of sum things up. So we talked about the beginning, something called the chief complaint, when people come in and, and, uh, and, and ask their questions or, or state their complaint, and we talked about really the role of emergency medicine. Now we're going to wrap it on home. We call this the assessment and plan, and that's when people are ready to rock and roll. People in my office, you give them a diagnosis, a game plan, and then, and then we'll see you as a follow-up, because that's the most important thing, at least in primary care, is follow up. So I want Dr. Wilson to give us kind of a couple closing take-home remarks about, about emergency room medicine, about what you want uh, our listening public to know, uh, just to understand what you guys are doing and, and really um, the, the whole system. Give us a few take-home points on everything we're going to be talking yeah, about today. Sure, sure. I mean, as emergency physicians, we're there to uh, you know, assess for the emerging condition that may require us to intervene very quickly to either stave off morbidity or mortality associated with a disease process. Um, sometimes we have to tailor expectations because people come in with expectations that may or may not be realistic um, based upon our assessment of that patient at the time or what they may want out of the visit. And you know, we, we're sorry sometimes that we can't always provide what people's expectations are, but we can provide what is necessary for an individual when they come to the emergency department to really make sure that your emergent condition is not at not causing anything at this time. You don't have an emergent condition at this time. So we're trying to be as confident as we can when we see you um, to rule out an emergent condition. We always try to make sure that there's follow-up that you can have arranged because there's always the ability for us to re-see you if there's some changes in condition, which all conditions can change. Um, but uh, 
what we're here to do is look for the emergent condition and rule that out. And once we're done with that, we're likely going to either send you home, but if we find something that requires hospitalization, we'll hospitalize you. Um, so just the, the biggest thing is trying to make sure your expectations are, are, are really realistic and not based upon some fantasy of what you see on the show ER or what you see on, you know, any other, you know, fantasy show out there. I mean, the only fantasies out there are Fantasy Highland, and that was Mr. Rourke back in the day. Um, but, um, yeah, we're, we're here just to figure out the emergency condition, and, and once we figure that out, if there's one that exists, we'll take care of that for you. Excellent. Dr. Flanagan, give us a couple take-home points. Yeah, so actually it's kind of funny because I wrote some notes ahead of time and I basically wrote the exact same thing. So <laughs> it's, it, it causes a lot of frustration for patients and for us as physicians because we obviously want our patients to be satisfied with their care and happy with their care and feel that they received good care because um, we feel like we provide good care. Um, but we won't always be able to tell you what's wrong. There's a lot of things that we're just not able to evaluate in the ER. For example, I had a, a mother one time very frustrated that I couldn't test her child for food allergies. And well, it's just not something that we're able to do. Um, so just as Daryl said, um, you know, we're gonna be able to tell you, you know, I don't think you're having a heart attack. If you're having chest pain, I don't think you have a blood clot in your lung. I don't know what's causing it for sure, but I don't think it's serious. And I think it's safe for you to go home. And a lot of people are very frustrated by that, but unfortunately we're just not able to always give you an answer, but we can at least reassure you, or we have an answer and know you need to stay in the hospital or whatnot, but. Excellent, thank you, Dr. Flanagan. And my kind of final words to this, hey, you know, this really is all about, about getting to know these individuals. That's why I wanted to do this show today. And really, I'm so super grateful for them to be here. And I really want people to understand that, again, there are physicians from all walks of life, from all specialties, that are here to help take care of you, to make sure that you live your healthiest and fullest lifestyle as you can. And remember, of course, you know you gotta make that follow-up. So when you go from the emergency room, make sure you follow up with your primary care doctor. As I stress, I can't stress that more than enough. So again, I wanna thank my guests today, Dr. Daryl Wilson and Dr. Kelsey Flanagan. You've been listening and watching live on Facebook and intellectualradio.com. This episode is written by Mark Gomez, MD and Tiffany E.R. Gomez. Producer is Tiffany E.R. Gomez. Music is by the wonderful Mr. Havis. Stay tuned for next week's episode. We're going to be doing my conclusion of the Get to Know Them series, part four, behind the scene with pharmacy. Check me out on my, web, on my website, www.drmarkgomez.com. Peace out. Thanks.